Hello there everyone, uh, this is just a short video I decided to do on Darkest Dungeon and uh, in this video I want just to cover 8 basic battle strategies that uh, new players can use of course experienced players who have a lot of hours in the game already will be familiar with all these but uh, you know like a lot of new players struggle with the game and you know always have a lot of questions so I thought I'd make this video to just cover a few of the strategies um, this doesn't really include anything regarding like provision management, stress management, and you know, attracting the curious. This is just for the battles, which strategies which are, which will serve you well in majority of the battles of the game. So, without further ado, let's get to it. First one: damage over time. Damage over time is damage which uh, it's like a status effect that uh, deals damage or a uh, certain amount of damage every turn to the enemy, and that's mostly can be either bleed or blight. So skills. That they'll bleed or blight damage. They will once if they hit the enemy, and the enemy gets affected, then they will deal damage, subsequent damage every turn. The useful thing about it is that first of all, it's extremely useful in enemies with a high protection. So enemies with high protection stat, they will be resisting. They, it's like a defense. They will be resisting a lot of your regular damage. So, but this kind of um, bleed or blight damage, it goes straight through. And another great thing about this is that it can stack. So, say you're dealing. 5 damage of blight a turn, if you reapply the state, it will stack up so it will be 10 damage every turn. And then you can keep, keep doing that and an adventure enemy will be losing, a high health enemy will be losing quite a lot this way. Second strategy is stunning. One thing you have to realize in turn based games, especially in a game like this, is that each turn is a commodity. Each turn is, a, is important and if you take away an enemy's turn, you take away quite a lot from them. And likewise, if they take away your turn, you, you, your strategy could easily fall apart and stunning is a really nice and quick way of taking away someone's turns without actually destroying them so it's highly advisable if you are able to bring at least one character who can stun enemies especially the most dangerous enemies who can actually hurt you the high damage low health enemies which you can stun the first turn and then you can finish them off before they even get a chance to go in the second turn that's going to be extremely useful in general stunning is quite useful as a battle opener because you know you've got three or four enemies at the same time, if you stun at least one of them, you're already reducing the number that attacking you that turn. Third strategy, skills that move your party members. Now this, there are some skills which will move your party member who uses the attack, will move them either forward or backwards, and this can create a very nice dynamic, because a lot of those skills are pretty powerful, or they can place them in a spot that could then activate another skill now, like for example, a highwayman has a nice combination like a duelist advance, which moves them forward. And then if they move, if they move to, to the to the front line, the first rank, then they can do a point blank shot, which does colossal damage to the front line enemy and also moves them back. And then they can keep repeating this procedure again, or they can combine it with another character that does the movement like this. Another good thing about the skills that move your party members is that if your party gets shuffled, like during an ambush, then uh, you want to quickly get to the position where the where the party member is op optimal. You know, you can use their optimal skills, and instead of just moving them manually, which wastes turns, best way is to use these skills, which already automatically move them. So, especially stuff like Crusaders, you know, which are frontline party members, and if they get moved to the back and they have Holy Lance, they can quickly move their way forward while dealing a lot of damage to the enemy. Number four, skills that move the enemies. This is probably even more useful because enemies also have optimal positions with optimal skills from each position. So, for example, an enemy that's used to being at the front, if they move to the back, then they're not going to be able to do their front, their powerful front row skills. They have to be finding a way to move closer. Or likewise, the back row enemies, if they move to the front, they'll be vulnerable. So that's something very useful as well if you want to really mess up the enemy strategy and make them more vulnerable. Number five, marking targets for extra damage. Now there are some characters, um, that some classes you can use which have an ability called mark. What marking does is that it basically makes enemies receive more damage uh, from certain attacks and uh, that usually carries also either a dodge or a protection debuff which is really great because a lot of late game enemies especially have dodge or protection. 
And then there are also, uh, and each of those classes also have attacks which deal more damage to the mark targets. So you can all synergize these kind of classes together to create some really colossal damage to the enemy within a single turn. Strategy number six, stacking heal bonuses with relics. So one of the things you can do, especially useful in the late game dungeons, like the champion dungeons, is that your heals will not be very colossal. I mean, they're all right, but they will not be anywhere near enough to mitigate the damage that the enemies will be dealing at those stages. So one of the good strategies I like to use is that I give them trinkets, I give the, my vessel trinkets with healing that they can, can do. And if you also have some of your characters, which are like tanks in particular, if you have some of them wear trinkets which increase the amount of healing they receive, that also has a stacking effect. So you have a Vestal which has more heal, and then you have a tank character which receives more heal, so it all combines and you can get some decent portion of healing. Number 7, stacking buffs and debuffs in battle. So, the buffs and debuffs, they also stackable, and some of those buffs and debuffs are really good. The particular ones you wanna prioritize would be like, protection and dodge are good buffs for you to increase on yourself, so St characters like Man at Arms, for example, they can, uh, if when they're guarding an ally, they will have a protection buff, and if you keep doing it several turns in a row, it stacks up, so you can get to a really high amounts, like 80% protection, which is which will make him receive very tiny amount of damage. And the same with the dodging, which Grave Robber when um, she does the Shadow Fade, and these when they stack up, they are really great. And same with debuffs, like a damage and the damage and protection and dodge debuffs, like Occultist has a weakening curse for example, which does a really great damage debuff on the enemies. So these kind of debuffs are extremely useful because if you do them like 2-3 times in a row, it has a colossal effect and suddenly all those hard hitting enemies are no longer that dangerous. And the last 8th one, shielding allies. So there are some classes like Mana Tarms and Hounds, they have, uh, have abilities which can shield the allies. Good thing about that is that if, if you have a vulnerable ally who is about to get killed, you can have them quickly move in and defend that ally. And what defending does is that when an enemy targets that ally, the man at arms or the hound master will automatically take the hit for them. And a good, another good thing is that because these shielding allies abilities also increase their protection or dodge, it also has like a double effect. So not only do they protect an ally, they're also making themselves stronger. The only th time that shielding allies is going to fail you is the time when the shielder and the shield D are both getting attacked at the same time. So if they get attacked at the same time, then they can't protect their ally. That's the only times you have to watch out for that. But that's about it. I hope you found this video useful and uh, see you guys later. Bye bye.